But here we are. So welcome everyone to what is actually the, the second in this series of uh, live interactive conversations on the Deep Transformation Network. <clears throat> and it's a total delight for me to welcome Tyson Young Kapoda uh, today, who's the author of the amazing book, Sand Talk. And now, uh, Tyson, I'll, I'll do to you what you did to me the other day. Like, here it is. It's, the, what, what an ama it's just a great book. Um, and he's not just that, but he's also a traditional <clears throat> tool and weapon carver uh, and a senior research fellow in indigenous knowledges at Deakin University in Melbourne. And he's an all round amazing, lovely person, even though he, he, he might claim otherwise if, if you ask him that. But um, Tyson and I knew, knew of each other's work for a while before we actually got to kind of connect directly with each other, which actually only happened last month or so uh, when we were on a panel together. And we kind of uh, hit it off. And within a couple of days, actually, we were holding a yarn uh, together on Tyson's podcast called The, the Other Others. Um, I love that name, by the way, Tyson. Um, and I, I, I don't know about you, Tyson, but right away, I felt I was in the presence of a kindred spirit. Um, and you know, before I even knew it, just a few minutes in, we were delving deep and uncovering all kinds of stuff, uh, stuff deeper than me that and normally never gets out in some sort of podcast interview or anything like that. And um, I felt to myself, this is a person I'd love to have a conversation with on our Deep Transformation Network to kind of share that magic. And so here we are. And so we're going to yarn together as Tyson uh, calls it for about half an hour or so. But after that, I wanna open it up uh, to all of you and basically to ask Tyson and me, about whatever's meaningful to you. And you know, these, are, these are called interactive conversations for just that reason. It's really about all of us as a community, really connecting about um, the stuff that really means the most to us. Well, so Tyson, thanks so much for being here today. How, how, how are you doing, my friend? Yeah, you great, okay yeah. great. As always, you know, we connected over being negative anthropists. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> So I named that uh, episode "Negative Entropy is a Team Sport." I love that. Um, I know. I really, I, re so I that, really enjoyed that. But um, <clears throat> that, yeah, that that negative entropy being, you know, that it's easier to break shit than make shit. Exactly. That's what en entropy is. But then negative entropy, like uh, you know, it, it's even harder than all of it. It's the hardest thing of all to um, to care for things. You know, to That's facilitate right. all those regenerative loops and. Exactly. You know, uh, to sort of maintain, you know, to be that maintainer. And um, I mean, there's no single one of us can do that alone or, you know, that's it's a team sport. Uh, we've got to do that yeah. together. And, and I think we just, yeah, we connected on that that little groove and then off we went. Yeah. <laughs> what what a good yarn. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's not it's not just a team sport. It's the ultimate team sport. It's basically what life has been doing since it first began a few billion years ago on earth and that's part of this amazing way in which we're also so deeply connected which i, mm. I hope we'll be be getting into but you yeah, know yeah. one one thing when we were talking last month tyson and you it, it was actually on that panel something that really stuck with me was when uh, you gave us this kind of chuckle about that subtitle of your book um which is as you can see it's um it's called sand talk how indigenous thinking can save the world. And Tyson was quick to say, hey, those are not my words. That's what the publisher wanted to use. So I've been thinking about that for a while, actually, since then. And I just wanted to ask you, Tyson, so how, how, how did that come down? Like, did you have another subtitle in your mind? Um, uh, I, I just, I always, let, when, yeah. I always let other people put a title on my thing, because my titles are always like really obscure and there's like 12 layers of, <laughs> meaning that you have to pass through before you can figure out what the hell I'm talking about, you know, in the titles. I, like I get in my way, my own way with the title, trying to be too clever. Yeah. So the original title of the book was Forever LTD kind of thing. Oh, what? Yeah. I, oh, that's so that's very different from Sand Talk. So, so yeah, they... you've got to mess around with like eight layers of irony to before you can figure out what the hell that means. You know, so LTD is limited. Okay. But then you got forever and okay what does that mean interesting juxtaposition and yeah well it's just it's just that that way that um 
anything that's kind of true <laughs> and real and it works like you know regenerative design or <laughs> like anything like that um as soon as you give it a name um as soon as people start you know acting upon it together in that sort of negative entropy team sport way um you know liberalism is this amazing shape-shifting beast that can just absorb that and take it on say yes yes of course <laughs> come in and it just envelops it and then keeps the name and then changes it into something else to turn it into a um you know a weapon of mass destruction within minutes exactly there was no, that idea totally that like you. It, the worst thing about my book were like the worst possibility would be that lots of people would read it and 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 that civilization would embrace it <laughs> right in and fact perhaps like it, that, I, I wrote that it. in there there's how, a how, so there's a chapter that's actually called forever limited i got um, you that's where i say that and um and so that was supposed to be the title of the book you know that the corporatization of um of, of anything real so that we you know i mean it's hard to find people like yourself um who are operating in this space who haven't had audience capture to the point where they're they've become wellness gurus you know in the kind or uh, you know wellness gurus or sustainability gurus or something in that that whole sort of industrial complex <laughs> right of you know no, I, yeah i totally but, hear you and that's and that's something I think both you and I are so focused on is how this kind of global capitalism system just sucks everything up. It's like this massive vacuum cleaner that mm. just kind of uh, sucks everything, all like people, ideas, uh, nature, life into like this resources for exploitation. Yeah, and, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally get you. And But at, at the same uh, time, so that is a marketing trick, you know, how indigenous thinking can save the world. And I don't believe it, but you're like the first person who started convincing me that maybe it could be true with your stuff about uh, true cliches. Yeah, well, that's the thing that I want to, you know, I, I kind of promised people we would get into. So let's take a look at that. So I guess I, I was thinking about this whole notion of cliches because we, we titled the, uh, this talk for, um, in case anyone, anyone forgot, going beyond the cliches, how indigenous knowledge could really help transform the world and so that's that's kind of what i but then when i started thinking about it, i was going well actually the thing about cliches is they become cliches because they're actually incredibly true right so the, the first person that said it you know like as as black as night or whatever it might be um it's like that that was actually really true but then it gets so true so obvious then people just get stuck on that and then they don't go below the surface so I guess one of the things pretty much, I, I would imagine almost everyone in this conversation right now in this group today has a sense of there is something truly valuable about indigenous knowledge. And, they, and pretty much I'm sure we all recognize there's something fundamentally flawed and destructive about this dominant worldview. So where does it b become true and where does it lose that and become a cliche? I mean, what what do you think about that, Tyson? What do you think is is true about that? What indigenous knowledge actually can do for the for a totally destructive culture today? Well, that 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 would yeah, it's like what it could do in an alternative reality where that action didn't happen. That kind of co opting, uh, yeah, jujitsu ju move that that this kind of big self organizing you know um system um that's enveloped the planet this whatever you want to call it capital um you know i don't know the satanic pedophile <laughs> network or whatever your thing is go for it um use your metaphors that's great but um yeah whatever that thing is this big self-organizing system you know that just absorbs things and then turns around to itself you know uh, puts it in service of the machine that's eating everything um, yeah, in, in a world that wasn't that, then indigenous thinking could save the world. But then if that was the case, then the world wouldn't need saving. So I don't know. <laughs> That's a good Look, point. Look, you know, in, indigenous thinking is just, you know, everybody's got a poster of a like Indian chief, you know, on the, on the wall somewhere with some, you know, wisdom quote that 
they never actually say right. who are. <laughs> exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. Everyone got drain catcher or smudging stick or, uh, you know, something. Uh, people are going burning incense, people, are, you know, all the things, but none of the spirit, you know. Right, um, which gets to these these kind of issues like the idealization of yeah. indigenous people. It's like, oh, mm. you're indigenous, so you must be yeah. wise. Yeah, well, it's like uh, uh, it's let like me let me burning, like, at, your, at your at your feet and teach me, yeah. oh, indigenous but, person. But, but but not really wanting that because it's freaking hard, and like that's your whole life. You know, get to like party. <laughs> so you know. It, it's like burning incense sticks to make your house smell good. You know, right. you're purchasing and consuming this scent that you bring into your house, but you have no idea of how to, you know, commune with your ancestors through that and how that's supposed to focus your attention and then also focus the attention of your of your ancestors on the other side and then bring you into a communion together. I imagine, you know, uh, from that tradition that's that I know almost nothing about. You know, and and I still don't because that's mediated for me through a marketplace that um, sort of commodifies that. You know, um, you know. So I'm I'm sitting on uh, Bunurong country here in Nam, uh, which some people are calling Melbourne uh, now mm-hmm. temporarily. Um, you know, basically concrete on top of a drain swamp at the moment, and uh, three and a half thousand kilometers from home in the north. Um, from my people there, my family, and um, you know other family that are scattered throughout <laughs> the continent, and I'm sort of sitting trying to make sense of all that, and then you know trying to come. I'm still after a few years here, trying to come into the the country and culture of the you know host tribe that's here, you know right. who well have welcomed me and, and brought me in, but I'm you know a lot of that stuff is still moderated through a marketplace whereby those people you know, many aspects of it they have to perform you know for outsiders and you know and it's there's an economic uh, thing there so it's it is really hard to come into the you know truly come into a place uh, when you've got an extra layer in the stack that's sort of been jammed in there um, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah no i bet and it I could imagine it probably gets actually incredibly frustrating for you when I bet people do idealize you and, uh, oh, you're the author of Sand Talk. Like, uh, and do you feel like there's like a, a Tyson who's the actual real Tyson and then this person who's the author of Sand Talk who's kind of out there somewhere and like, who the, who the fuck is that person? Yeah. Did that, did that I, happen to you? Yeah, well, well I, I, I try to avoid having this avatar that separates from me. Yeah. And sort of the the whole last three years has just been flat out trying to stop that from happening. Right. Um, so that means I, I basically just self sabotage all the time. Right. <laughs> right. You know. And so, but that means that um, you end up creating this kind of entropic avatar instead. <laughs> you know. Tell me. Um, tell me so, more about that. What does that mean? Well, I, I like I um I don't know. So I like I behave badly. In things because I I don't want people to be able to you know put right. me forward as all oh, this wisdom, this yeah. wisdom person you know, um, and it really helps because like I don't have many of these sort of you know visual or audio sort of markers that sort of sound like a fella standing on one leg on a rock with a bone through his nose you know what I mean so you know that I'd like highlight those things and then make fun of myself and um, I swear a lot you know right. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, well, Cambridge wants you to do a, uh, an event, you know, <laughs> for all the deans or something, and I'll be there. Hey, mother, <laughs> whatever, you know, I might say something terrible. Right. Um, I don't know. So I kind of, you know, like I've kind of like, don't, don't, don't listen to me. You know, I, I don't know anything. I'm not, I'm not an, a person of status in my culture or in my community. I'm like a you know, very lowly person, you know, so. Well, how, how did that matter? People... Like it, it's, it's very yeah. good. It's a good place to be like a person of low status in our community because you still have love and respect. Like everybody has that. Right. You know, there's the quality that goes on. So you don't feel the need to, you know, have to, you know, have ambition and things like that. And that's great. But yeah. I don't like, I'm sort of trying to avoid people ascribing this kind of wisdom status to me that doesn't actually exist. But so then I go too far the other way, you know, 
like I go full Loki trickster and um and then that's like this kind of really crappy and tropic avatar that starts to emerge yeah. and, and then I started doing yeah. that in my life I'm like walking around the living room going ah um yeah and like my kids know, are going what, what? <laughs> I I to- I so I so hear you Tyson but you know the thing what makes it kind of complex in my yeah. mind is that, and this is not, I'm not saying this to try to be nice or b- bother you up or anything like that, but this, it's actually because it's hard for you to, to, for you to receive this, but actually there is incredible wisdom in your book. And so, and that wisdom, and I'm not saying that is your, necessarily your wisdom, because yeah. I'm so, I'm still with you. Yeah, the wisdom, you. both what I've tried to put out in my writing and what I know you put out in your writing, all I, I sense you're trying to do, and you tell me if this is wrong, but you're trying to basically, you're taking the wisdom that's there, that's all around you. And in your book, that's one of the wonderful things you do is you, you, you let the, elders the local elders speak for themselves and you're just basically mm. quoting them and, yeah. and then you're just like putting the pieces together and saying well i guess this mm. is how i make sense of it yeah so i totally get that but and to model to be able to model being a person who doesn't have their act together and is making sense of all that it, it's good because nobody has their act together yeah you know i, I don't have to be ascended to, right. to access the basic levels of that that can you know mm, make you know that can do the negative entropy thing and improve the world yeah yeah, yeah. do you but do you do you also find though that people in your own community do they give you a hard time like oh you know oh it's the it's the, the big oh, yeah. man's coming or i mean do, do they kind of make it um you know like yeah. make fun of you i bet well in, in my home community it's like right, you know, right. it's like ah oh, so i don't know I, I, I got my doctor like 12 years ago and it was like a year of, hey, <laughs> why you got to be doctor? Why can't you just be one of us? Right, you know? right, right. Like, it doesn't make me not one of anybody. I'm like still here. <laughs> you know, it's just that was suspicion for a long time. But then the, the same guy, you know, he might be, um, he, he might go into town and, and you know, have a have a few too many to drink and and then be like standing out on the street going hey that's my uncle that's my uncle there doctor doctor yanka porter you can all get stuff we got doctor here you got nothing you know so you know there's that that sort of conflicting you know pride and also but the need to like uh you know um make sure nobody's getting like ahead of anyone else nobody's you know yeah. rising up and getting ahead of themselves and trying to be boss or anything like that so it's but i think once people realize that you've got absolutely no ambition at all you know they tend to just come back into good relation with you again um you know but i yeah and there's sometimes there's you know like we've got a middle class sort of in some of the cities uh, in australia in the aboriginal community and that's like people have had to like fight and kill to get there, you know. So they don't like it if someone starts doing well. <laughs> so, right. so you got to be yeah. you got to be yeah. ready for some uh, some pretty yeah some pretty heavy heavy breathing going on. So, but so I'm going to make it harder for you now, Tyson, because like the 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 thing is, I I really I follow everything you're saying, and I really get it that. Mm we the the last thing you want is to be um puffed up into this like mm. you know indigenous guru and all this kind of stuff but then we got to recognize the fact that our world is headed for disaster um, mm. and i think pretty much everyone on this call right now shares that understanding like we're all headed right. for total destruction we do need to something needs to be saved um, and we need to turn to all the sources of wisdom that are out there and we need to actually do that at a scale bigger than has been done before and yeah. faster than before. And I mean, I don't need to tell you, you know, all of these things, of course. I mean, it's in your yeah. book and you know it. So what about, does that put a responsibility on you? Because I mean, it, it does, it, but it shouldn't be out of my pay grade. It'd be like me what? saying that calling you Rabbi Jeremy, you know, <laughs> And and that and you're going like no 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 that's that's not right that's not right <laughs> don't right. be calling me Rabbi Jeremy <laughs> and like um you know but I'm like no no 
Jeremy, you know, it's really important. So many people have found so much in your books yeah, yeah, and right. reconnected and what you're doing is really important. And, you know, the, the world's dying and we need you. And so Rabbi Jeremy and go on, <laughs> step up. And it's like, yeah, no, you're going the wrong way. Cause you're like, no, that's just, that's just my, my thing over there. Like I, I can still be like, you know, a guru in the guru sphere without having to be Rabbi Jeremy, please. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I totally hear you, because yeah. ultimately, it's sort of it's really what it is, isn't it? It's about setting the conditions for things to happen. Not actually, yeah. as soon as anybody tries to put themselves up and says, "I've got the answer," um, well, it's easier if it comes from you, at least, That's and be, because at least, like, if anyone like me puts up and says, "I've got the answer." Here's another white guy from the global north telling us, yeah, they're, they're the people who screwed us up to begin with. And, um, yeah. and that's the last thing anybody needs. There is a lateral. certain quality that the leadership that we actually need right now um, should be from women, should be from people from the global south, should be people whose color of their skin is not like lily white. It should be the people who actually have the cultures that have been under destruction for hundreds mm. of years. So yeah. there is a sense about that. Um, and I mean, maybe it would be good to try to get some essence of it's what, like when we talk about what an indigenous knowledge or tradition or values can do for mm. the world, maybe we should try to highlight a little bit about what, what they might be. Um, mm. I mean, I don't know if you know, there, there was this great research done by a Comanche um, social activist. Her name was LaDonna Harris. Um, and she spent years um, it, looking at indigenous values around the world, trying to come up with a sense of what she and other people are calling indigeneity. And she actually spent a lot of time with Aboriginal elders in, um, in Australia and other parts of the world to try to say, what is, what are the shared sense of values? And she came up with what she called the four R's. Mm. Um, and she called them relationship, responsibility, reciprocity, and redistribution. Mm. And um, I, to me, that, that felt really great. But then it, it seems like it really, fun, it's almost like that first one, relationship, seemed mm. to be so fundamental. And I, I, that's so fundamental in your writing, too. So I just kind of wonder what you think about that. What, what would you say are... I mean, what, what would you distill? Like, if it's not about, it's not about Tyson, it's not about Aboriginal culture, mm. it's not about, mm. and even indigenous, um, yeah. but it's about something deeper. What is that? What is that mm. that, that we need to focus our, mm. our attention on? Well, I think, I mean, heuristics are, are handy, you know, in terms of you know, being able to focus your attention uh, in, in one area and look for things. But um, I, I, I usually find heuristics that are um, trying to distill, and I'm guilty of it. I've done a thousand of them, same way, you know. Um, I, I try and turn them into verbs, if there's one word in, in English, rather than an abstract noun. Right, yes. You know, especially yeah, like, um, all-encompassing, because yeah. then yeah. you, you so, miss things. Right, yeah. So you look at uh, reciprocity and redistribution together, and they cancel each other out. Like They don't, they don't work together. You've got, you're basically making an argument for, you know, two completely opposite economic systems there, you know, because reciprocity, that's basically a debt-based model. There's that idea that you're, um, you're beholden to somebody, you know, somebody shares with you, then there's this debt. I see what you're saying. This void well, you know, I, I, I you think have to she... reciprocal, you have to pay yeah. it back, but we, we don't have that here. We have a demand sharing economy. So it's, yeah. it is all about that distribution. If you have something, anything, then that will be redistributed before you walked 20 mm. steps down the road. You know, um, yeah. if you've got $50, you're not going to have that for very long. <laughs> okay. That's everything is constantly redistributed. There's a massive high velocity of every single dollar you know um, in, in our communities in that way and it's always been thus um yeah so it's not a give and take model yeah, it's a give yeah. give give some people call it Mapuji like that it's a give give model you know um yeah so those i don't know and 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 so i'm i'm trying to um i'm trying to excise the heuristics out of my yeah you know my tendency towards because that's what self-help gurus always do 
Yeah. They always end up with the four rules for right. it. Yes. It's a, it's you know what I mean? Point. Here's yeah. the principles. Here's the five principles of, of that. Sand talk's full of them, man. I read back through Sand Talk now and I just go, oh, that's some guru shit there. <laughs> I was doing that. That's uh, all these tricks. I was love bombing them and giving them a slap and making them all discombobulated and then offering them a heuristic here if you follow this it'll all be fine and then love bombing them again you know i'm like ah i was totally radicalizing these people um poor buggers and they're still reading it you know and i'm like no 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 i gotta write another book and try and figure out how to take the um coercive self-help developmental discourses out of my speech and out of my writing and it's like can we even speak english without them yeah it's like you know, like modern English is pretty much, that's what it is. It's just an induction into a cult <laughs> of liberalism and neoliberalism. It's like, so anyway, that's the challenge now. Yeah. Are you, are you thinking? I don't know if that? I even asked, answered your question. <laughs> yeah, you really did. You, I, I, was, I, was, I was just kind of really getting what you're saying about the abstracting. And that's so much of what yeah. it is which does and and it's really yeah. really true and sort of abstracting in itself it's almost like hierarchical i mean it's sort of yeah. I, maybe that's my interpretation of what you're saying like yeah. it sort of it says what how do we distill and it creates a hierarchy this is the top level and then things mm. and so even in the language itself like this whole thing about proto-indo-european languages that they have yeah. this kind of um hierarchical and subjects and objects and someone's always doing something to something else rather than being and mm. yeah, and mm. I I would imagine Aboriginal languages don't have like subjects and objects like in the same way. Is that right? Um, yeah. Well, they can, but it, it's it's quite it's it's fairly fluid as well. Right. And yeah. there's always a lot more detail. <laughs> you know, um, the, the prefixes and suffixes carry a lot of information. You know, you can basically keep adding onto a word until it's a paragraph. Um, in, in a lot of languages yeah. um you know i'm lucky enough to have a a really simple language that doesn't that's not that complicated uh, it's probably the easiest one um a quick book is really easy um but yeah things are things are around the other way things uh move differently often the the way you actually speak the language though it really relies heavily on a shared context of meaning you know yeah um, yeah exactly. as well so there isn't this linguistic precision um, sometimes around things so you know while that that's that's you're able to do that with the language you don't often have to because there's shared meaning going on right if there's people who can speak your language then they know what you're talking about before you even say it so yeah it's um it's pretty cool but yeah there's that uh there's that whole idea coming out of turtle island you know of verb-based languages rather than noun-based languages and, yeah and that you know and then that you know but see this sparks interesting ideas like what would an accounting system look like that measured actions and relationships mm -hmm. rather than things you know mm -hmm. yeah currently looking in yeah i'm currently currently having some good yarns about that with like this idea of gross domestic happiness and like right. the whole well-being you know accounting stuff that was kind of like trendy for a while and you know but that just didn't work <laughs> well it's it still it still has that, traction I mean, but yeah well it has traction as a catchphrase yeah. and as one of those true cliches that we're going to use as a cliche but not anything else it's like you know even and everybody always wants to talk about bhutan like you know they nailed it you know just because they said it <laughs> right you know it, they, it didn't stop them from importing soap operas from india that just completely subverted the like the central linchpin of their culture which is the grandmothers yeah. who right. ended up spending all day watching indian soap operas and are no longer grandmothering mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know what exactly. i mean and that's just completely so their their gdh has dropped like massively <laughs> just from one <laughs> just from one thing you know so um yeah and it's always i mean how do you make policy for that how do you make policy for um you know, to defend against all these like little lateral things that are going to come in, you know, you can make policy to make sure things are robust and resilient and adaptive to deal with things like that. But you can't make policy, you know, in one direction and go, ah, and this is the measure of happiness and we will follow it exactly. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Right. Um, people like to think it is. 
Yeah. Everyone from Gwyneth Paltrow to, you know, the treasurer of Bhutan or whatever. So what do you, do you feel like all this, basically this entropy that's taking place, our civilization that mm. is destroying life, do you feel that there is a path that it can actually be be diverted into a different direction? Or do you feel like anything that you or others put out that has this, you know, that channels that wisdom can only get uh, commodified, basically, because the system- I, I think there's two movements that have worked. There's only two movements in history that have really worked. Um, and one of them worked because uh, it was it was asking for something that you know the establishment the system didn't mind us having. <laughs> In fact, we're happy for us to have. And and the other one, it worked because it didn't have a name, um, although it's been named now. And it had no leaders. It had no real communication, but it just kind of arose in the collective consciousness. You know, like this collective adaptive response that was organic. So right, you've got everyone only, on the edge of their seat now. What are those? Right. What are those? Come on. Well, so the first one, the one that um, that the establishment didn't mind us having, that the system was actually happy for us to have, so they let us have that, uh, was that massive movement, um, hashtag free Britney. <laughs> that worked really well. So that's that's one of the two things, <laughs> the two movements that's ever worked um, in the history of this civilization. <laughs> um, yeah, the other one, though, was the, is the Great Resignation. Mm. So everyone over COVID, like millions and millions, like tens of millions of people all just going, oh, stuff it, <laughs> you know, with work. I'm not going back to work or I'm like, I'm leaving that job and I'm, I'm going to bloody go, you know, go for less money at a place where they're going to let me, you know, go fishing from time to time. Um, you know, or it's like, I don't need three jobs. I'm going to, I'm going to let two of these jobs go. Um, but anyway, but it, it was just kind of a, this de-emphasis on work and, and and stuff and a realization that we don't quite need as much stuff to live. Um, and, that, you know, <laughs> the things we really value are the things that are outside that we can just go and enjoy for free. Um, yeah, so the great resignation, they started to call it now, but it's outsiders who are like scratching their heads going, why doesn't people want to work? <laughs> How are we going to keep wages low? How are we going to like exploit people if they don't want the things that we're offering? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what we'll call it the great resignation. The people who are actually in it don't call it anything. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a leader. It doesn't have any influences. There are no influences in this movement. It just kind of happens, you know, because it's real. Um, mm. Anyway, that's for me, that's that's the biggest resistance movement. And the only successful resistance movement I've ever seen in the history of the civilization. The rest of them have all been co-opted. Mm. Yes, including civil rights, including, you know, women's rights, including everything. But did we go longer than half an hour already? Yeah, we go yeah. Over. yeah. So, we, you know, I'm thinking um, that it might be a good time to uh, invite anybody who wants to share their questions or reflections on this to, you know, um, go into that, that reactions on the Zoom and put your hand up and then um, and we'll spotlight you and, and bring, bring you into the, into the conversation. But I guess um, as we're um, inviting people to do that, I kind of want to challenge you a bit on that, Tyson. You know that? Because yes, I agree that things get co-opted and I see that only too clearly, but I also feel an I sense, and this is the sense I get from this incredible deep transformation network. Where we've got like a thousand people in just a couple of months just joining and being part of this is that there is a, there's a sense that not just the thousand of people joining this network, but millions of people, millions of people around the world have of that shared connection. They don't want to be part of this destruction. Um, mm. And there, there's this incredible movement around the, the commons. There's this uh, great thinker, David Bolia, um, and many others who have, have like, are ex like talking about all these different ways in which people organize together. Like say, someone like, take Wikipedia, for example. That's a, a, um, here's something, it has not, it has avoided getting commodified. It is mm. this incredible treasure 
for the human race right now that people can act and sure it's got issues and there's a might be a particular word or whatever in wikipedia that people say oh you know this is isn't um it's it's gotten shut down or this is wrong but in general it's his treasure it's his treasure because somebody had this idea and instead of going oh i want to become the next billionaire doing it jimmy wales he said i want to put something of true treasure and value into the world and it, it and he did that and he trusted he trusted that shared cooperation of people which is mm -hmm. kind of what i was talking with you about when we were talking last month and you, uh, when you said like oh maybe indigenous values actually can offer something is because it's not about indigenous values it's about human values mm -hmm. and i think those are those are the values that we actually share with each other we we actually don't want to be uh, destroying the world we don't want to be separate we don't want to be caught in these zero-sum games our our basically our commodified consumer uh, conditioning takes humans that are born wanting to love and be connected and live that kind of life that indigenous people did live for most of human history. And it says, no, sorry, you don't get that. You're actually going to be selfish and cons and, and it, they'd have to get trained to be that. But it has to like, take every single person born, hundreds of millions of people every year, and it has to actually undo their actual true humanity. So I guess what I'm kind of saying to you is, I'm, I actually feel there is there are all these movements taking place. Many people are aware of the dangers of commodification. Mo more people, I agree, right now are wanting to be commodified. They want to be the the you know get into this sort of hero guru thing or like uh, feel the power and all that stuff. Granted, I agree, but I feel like it, it will actually feels to me like the only chance we have is to mm. actually touch into what actually every single human being shares that one thing to be connected that wanting to be part of the community so i'm kind of challenging you tyson because what i'm saying is you actually have an opportunity to reach out to many of those people and say wow this is really valuable like there's a reason why people th there's a reason for those for why it becomes a cliche and the mm. reason is because people want to connect with the very thing that you're giving them that that sense of connecting to. So anyway, I'm I'm kind of um, I feel there's other possibilities out there in the world. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's that's basically what I'm putting my life into, because I just see like it's the only thing we can do right now. That's it. It's just to sort of be there for life, be there that's for it. what is possible. Yeah. But we need some negative feedback loops in there. You know, otherwise it just it it exactly. metastasizes into something that it's not. And people, you know, form committees and have treasurers and secretaries and yes. stuff. And, yes. And, and it all goes wrong. Yeah. You know, so I I'm I, just, uh, I, I totally you know, agree. It would be a negative, but I mean a negative feedback loop, which is yeah, um exactly. actually a good which thing. Which actually is a positive it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, yeah. stop the system. It, from it actually dying. stops stuff from getting <laughs> out of control. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Let's turn to some people who wanted to join in the conversation. I see uh, Elizabeth um, Sarturis. I think you're joining us from Hawaii, if I'm not mistaken there. Is that right? Re Hello, really great uh, to see you here, Elizabeth. And so why don't you um, share what, what your perspective is? Thank you. Aloha, aroha, talofa, all greetings from Pacific Islanders. Um, Tyson, it's a great honor to be able to talk with you. Um, I think uh, the, the reason that we need the voices of indigenous people who are still living, at least in part, in the original ways is because the mainstream culture has so disconnected humanity from the rest of nature. I crusade against using words like environment and encourage people to say ecosystems that you're part of mm -hmm. and, and so forth. And our major dictionaries actually define nature as, as what surrounds humans, not that we're not part of it. Yeah. So that is the culture that came up with, with a materialistic science that coined the term entropy. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, turned, it, it coined that term uh, in order to disconnect, <laughs> uh, to talk about a universe running down. Mm -hmm. I know no indigenous culture whose universe is running down. And then life of all horrible things got defined as neg entropy, the struggle against <laughs> this tide washing everything away. So 
that that to me was a real insult to life and mm. so i'm curious about your you're using the word uh, well, entropy <laughs> yeah but there, there are you know there are uh, entropic systems and and those have overtaken especially you know, human what ones. you're referring to as nature and, and everything else yeah and they're not just human ones because that would suggest that that's somehow that we're this bad seed, you know, and that would somehow, mm -hmm. you know, we keep getting sold this message that we're like, you know, naturally, like that's our nature to wreck everything, to grow, to expand, to progress, to develop, you know, <laughs> and that's not what we're all about as human beings. That's not our natural patterning, to use the silly word natural. Um, but yeah, it, it, there are entropic systems that have gotten out of control. Now, you know, there's always that bad seed in all of our creation stories. You know, all people, there's that thing that wants to do that, become greater than what it is, uh, to become greater than the things around it, to ignore the limits of the symbiosis, you know, in the systems around it, and to go for maximum power beyond that. Um, you know, all of our dreaming stories, mostly are cautionary tales about how to limit that, how to, how to get that, how to, how to prevent that. Um, the importance of spearing that fellow, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Hey, I did notice in the chat, and, and I'll just do this real quick because it's really important. Somebody referenced yeah. the concept of Leon from the from the Kimberley. Mm -hmm. uh, Aiden Date mentioned mm -hmm. that, and you know that that's really important. You want um, to say, say more about that, Tyson? Well, Leon, you know, it, it's not just like some self-help thing or some, you know, way to regulate your morality and principles of being. Like, yes, that's there um, and everything, but it's kind of, the, it's the basis of an economy, like a true economy that's embedded in landscape and community, you know, that are all one thing. You know, but it's sort of it's it's that's that's the thing at the individual level and in your individual relations locally, but then it scales from there, because then there's there's another word for the next concept that comes up all along the Matawara River there, all the tribes that live on that in that region, it comes up into another uh, concept for how all those different tribes need to interact together, and so that's that regional law there, but then that that um that scales up again to a bigger continental law of how that region interacts with all mm -hmm. the other regions, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, yeah. um, and then all the things that they have to do to ensure sustainability of the cultures, like, you know, making sure that your highest law and knowledge is being kept somewhere distant by another tribe yeah. as well. Cause that ensures interdependence. Like you can't do an imperialism <laughs> when other people are holding your holiest yeah. of holies. And if there's a volcano happens in your place, then you know that there'll be continuity and all that knowledge and language will be kept, you know, all, all that kind of thing. It, it's a, it's the way that our, that our culture scales and that our ways of being scales and our economies can scale without imperialism and without destruction. Yeah. So Leon is like the seed of that. And, you know, and these are the things that are, you know, and, and yes, that could save the world if it was applied, you know, but well, how could you? you? Know, I mean, I'm, you do have, it sounds to me like the three, things of government or whatever you know <laughs> you know but except then, it's like all the power is flowing the other way um so how do you reverse the flow of that and come back to uh that leon i think i think there's a lot of movements that move towards like the um what like they call subsidiarity moving and power down to the grassroots levels and this notion of fractal flourishing which is kind of like the, the way like you organize uh, communities at the small level. And then, you know, people like Eleanor Ostrom, you know, who's mm. this uh, theorist of the commons talks about these ways in which you can actually use like polycentric principles that, that apply to the commons at one level, but to multiple levels. So yeah. I, I, I do think that's the kind of example where what you're describing can be actually taken as a real model that can actually be mm. applied way outside of the area, which I think is incredibly valuable. That's so, it. And have a good laugh too, because it's not the tragedy of the commons, it's the comedy of the commons. Exactly, it's the comedy so of the commons. Let's flip that. With a yeah. happy ending too, exactly. Yeah. Um, Samuel, I see you, you, you have your hand up and you're next on the line here. Yeah, thanks so much for this um, awesome conversation, lads. It's been a pleasure as always. So I guess on that topic of fractal flourishing, um, I'm kind of thinking like, what does it look like? What sort of conditions do we need to create, I guess, to uh, allow 
for the emergence of these new ways of being like, you know, whether it's labeled game B, whether it's labeled indigenous ways of organizing polycentric governance, like how do we sort of, given that we are playing within the confines of a current system, which has specific rules and patterns, let's say that play out, how can we try and allow these more generative patterns to sort of manifest? Like given the fact that if we actively try to that sort of as Tyson was sort of saying that kind of somehow inhibits or can get in the way of. So yeah, I just thought I'd pose that one to you. Yeah. It's good to, good to see you, Sam. What um, do you think, Tyson? Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just be real quick because we're going to end up doing this thing where we spend 20 minutes on everything. So we'll go real fast. But I, I just think I, I do like that idea that comes out of the game B um, thing. You know, it's I, I'm still in dialogue with with that group um, because of some of the good stuff coming out of it. But this uh, language around, you know, all symbioses begin in parasitic relation, mm. you know, like that's if you reverse engineer any symbiosis because they look how is that impossible what's the chicken egg thing going on here like what started first if you reverse engineer those backwards map three you always find that they begin in a parasitic relation so i guess any change needs to begin in a parasitic relation you've got to tapeworm off this economy here uh, <laughs> tapeworm off this you know autocracy and oligarchy and all the rest and um and gradually come into a develop more of a symbiosis but that happens over time so mm. you know don't, don't get too upset if it doesn't happen overnight yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well you know like I, I i don't know where it originally began but what i do know is whatever what evolutionary biologists have shown is that the really the big phase transitions in life what made life actually get this richness and abundance on earth came from that mutually beneficial symbiosis that that parasitism may work in the short term, but it never works to actually lead to something that's more than sustainable, but generative and leads to yeah. something richer. The and relation so, has to change to a mutually so, yeah, beneficial. Yeah, you know, yeah, I feel like always looking for that mutual beneficial way of relating. To mm. me, that's that's really being in touch with, with life. Mm. So, yeah. But anyway, um, over to you, uh, Greg. Um, your hand is up. You, you're, you're next on our line there. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, good day, Tyson from uh, from Broome, home of the Yaru people. And uh, yeah, it's interesting hearing you talk about um, Leanne. And I guess um, I just wanted to make a comment about that that stuff it movement that you so beautifully labelled. Um, I guess coming together with people that are kind of collectively saying stuff it. And, but also coming together with those things from yarning around generosity and curiosity and just um, whether it's at the pub having a beer and that connection that happens when you when you come with that spirit and the stuff that comes up, the stories that people lean into and how there's a willingness just to kind of share who I am and hear who you are and, and just explore where that goes without being attached to some kind of um outcome and and then even bringing that to the work that i do like in in facilitating workshops just creating space rather than content for people just to catch up and have a bit of a chat and not attached to the work that you do just attached to whatever kind of bubbles up for you and and kind of honoring that and, and getting really curious about it and i just i just love the concept and so i bring bringing some of that work that you've been talking about and, and through your book together in the work that I do, but also in living in the Kimberley and just kind of interacting with the local community, local people, local landscape and environment. And it's just um, it's just a blessing to be able to sit back and say, well, bloody stuff it, like whatever. Yeah, um, slow down just, urgently, urgently slow yeah. down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I lived in Fiji that's, for a while and we used to say, hurry slowly, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah hurry slowly. Because if you if you hurry fast, you know, you're jumping to solutions and explanations and trying to find a narrative immediately and a solution immediately. You're just going to end up erecting a gallows out the front of the Capitol. You know, that's saying, yeah, that's all that's yeah, going to happen. Right. There. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. yeah. And Thank that's, you. yeah, that uh, ties in, you know, you, you guys probably know Bio Akamalafi and his whole thing is it's, everything is falling to pieces. There's one thing we all need to do slow down, just pause. And, that, and that's all right. And then there's this idea, thanks to Janelle, I think put in the chat about this, um, this way in which David Bolio, when he talked about how the commons can actually work well, he calls it soft or like gentle reciprocity. 
as opposed to this direct reciprocity. So it's not like I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, I'm gonna add up how many scratches I get and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's more like this kind of flow and distribution within like webs of relationship, which is I think what, um, what you were both just talking about there. So anyway, just trying to kind of get those, those uh, feelings. Um, and uh, why don't we turn to, uh, to you, Henry? I see your, your hand is up. Hey there, Henry. Hey. Hey, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for allowing me to ask a question. Um, yeah, in the context of um, this concept of Leon, which I'll definitely look more into, and um, place-based wisdom, um, and also trying to figure out a way forward to reincorporate that kind of human the way of relating that is natural to human beings into this crazy fucked up economic system. Um, and you also mentioned the idea of subsidiarity. How do you see, uh, what do you think of localization, the idea of economic localization that has been kind of in the way that Helena Norberg Hodge has coined it? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I can tell you, I, I think it's an essential feature of that of that vision of an ecological civilization of a civilization that is based on a different foundation than our one that is destroying the earth right now it has to start with that local focus that local economy people actually knowing each other people actually in touch with each other in touch with the earth where they're living and everything that can be needs to be uh, contained within that you know the actual lived physical earth where people where people are um, and at the same time, my own sense is, you know, every system, like every complex living system, whether it's how our brains work or whether an ecosystem or whatever it is, it works through what's called like these kind of um, small world networks, which means there's tons and tons of relationships happening close by next to you. And then the occasional big loop that connects with something else in the system, which makes the whole thing cohere and integrated. So... In, in my kind of vision of that, like localization is key. It's where we begin. But there's also these that some level of globalization, more in kind of our ideas and our thinking than, um, you know, not the kind of globalization we have right now where you sort of fly, you know, you destroy Kenya's um, local agriculture so they can then make coffee with, so that can be flown elsewhere in the world. So then everyone in Kenya then has to eat the food that gets imported or they're starving. That's disastrous globalization. So some level of globalization that allows us as a human superorganism to know we're connected with there are certain things have to be done on a global level. We have to recognize we are um, a big part of this planet, but beginning with the energy at the local level and keeping that all the power we can at the lowest level possible. Anyway, that's my take. What about you, Tyson? It, what, uh, yeah, I think it comes back to one of those R's you mentioned. You did lay out that heuristic, so I'm thinking through that as we go. But I mean, one of those R's, that responsibility, um, you know, this one, like, once again, that's a big abstract now there. And, you know, um, and we did in Australia for quite some time bring that up to try and describe this idea of relational obligation. You know, and it's the thing that upsets... You know, because we're not just this collective communal culture, you know, we actually really honor and respect the individual. You know, you are a fabulous, amazing individual, you know. However, you only exist within a web of relationships and you have obligations to those relationships and that's what checks you. There's a constant tension and balance between that. And so in my language, that's um, there is no abstract nouns at all. And, and it's not even a noun to talk about responsibility. It's an adverb. Mm, to mm. describe it how you how you walk or how you sit mm. and it has a body part in there so it's with an ear to your obligations mm. you know so we use that word responsibility to try and describe to people that uh, it got co-opted by um conservative policy makers um as a way to um to cut welfare mm. and as a way to cut spending and programs and yeah uh, yeah uh, social equity sort of things and positive discrimination, stuff like that. It's like, no, you've got to take responsibility, <laughs> you know, exactly. individually for making your own money in the economy. <laughs> Have a shower. 
<laughs> Take the bone out of your nose, wipe your bum, and get out there. Get a, get a suit on. What are you doing? Put on a hard hat. Build our minds, and then go away. Um, you know, yeah, that, that's where responsibility went. <laughs> but we're really talking about relational obligation. And it's all going to come back. The big answer comes back to that, Leon. And I can't talk about because that's not my story. But you look up Anne Polino, look at any of her speaking events where she's, she'll talk about that. Um, and some things she gets into it quite deeply. How it's this nested fractal sort of governance and uh, economic system as well you know, where it does, it starts at that individual level, but then comes out to those relations that you have in your clan family. And then it's, you know, then that scales out to your clan itself as an individual entity with sovereignty, the same way you are. Mm -hmm. No one can boss, but then it's in that interdependent relation with other clans. And then all that forms one group, which is also a sovereign entity, which then must exist in that maximum power principle, mm. you know, in that symbiotic way with the other tribes around it you know, in a regional thing, and that's one law as well, then that's one law group that then that scales up to, you know, interacting with all the other regional groups. And then there's laws for, you know, continental for how to do that, and then goes beyond that. So it scales in these nested fractals of, you know, mutual obligation, um, you know, mutual aid, uh, yeah, relational obligation. Um, yeah, so that that's how that works. But yeah, I, I've got a reference example here, and you got to look her up. Yeah, there. that's great. Well, I see, I see someone's put her name in the chat, and if anyone wants to put a website that they know is the right as a go-to one um, in the chat, let's follow that up. Thanks for that. Um, and Ani Ahava, um, would you like to join the conversation? Definitely. Oh, we we just we just lost your voice there. Um, you're still I, muted. And I am muted yet. No, okay. now we hear you. Yeah. Yes, I'd like to join the conversation. I'd like to lift the conversation. I'd mm -hmm. like to get the feminine voice in here. Great. I'd like to talk about life rather than such human centric discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is so boring to, to me. It's yeah. like I'm so clear about the fact that until we change our identity from, from human centric to life centric, mm -hmm. nature centric to being mm -hmm. autopoetic living beings mm -hmm. and identify as that rather than our, our human culture which doesn't know much yet in terms of how to live. So can we just lift it a little bit and uh, get Elizabeth Satoris back in and some of the women? Yeah, I love what you're saying, Ani. Thank, thank you for, for, for bringing that in. I also wanted to add, um, uh, there was a, actually somebody had put in the chat earlier um, who, um, well, his name identifies him as a male, um, but we're all life. Um, and his name is Mark Krennic. And he said, how about beyond human values to ecological values or biological values, being part of nature's tendency towards higher levels of complexity? And yeah, I, I'm with you entirely. Like, the, um, there's this quote that um, I basically seem to have settled on and live my life by. It's actually from... Albert Schweitzer in the 20th century, who said, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And, you know, and then he goes on and says, I cannot therefore but have reverence for all that is life. So, and so yeah. We're talking about identity. I, I'd really like to bring to front and center I, identity. Human nature, human is only an adjective. We are only an adjective in the larger scheme of things of nature. If we could begin focusing on talking about, you know, life-centric uh, subjects and thinking and knowledge, that would be a wonderful way to spend some time. I love it. Um, I don't even know how to do that in English. What? <laughs> I don't even know how to do that in English. I'm not not even sure English is capable of such a thing. It is. But I'll give it a go. That's a that's a good challenge. But um, it is capable. Yeah. When we start when we're talking about the systems that we're living in, 
It's 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 uh, which are human centric systems, which is the big illusion. But you know, that's a small. difficult. Human centric yeah. is small, e even though it's a big influence on Earth compared. I mean, when we say human nature, human is an adjective. Mm. It's just an adjective. We are yeah. nature. We are life. We are autopoetic uh, being. And I just wish we would focus on that more. Mm -hmm. God. This, I'm not, yeah. not autopoetic anymore. I don't organize myself. Yeah. I'm organized by a workplace. I'm organized by a, <laughs> relationships I, I have no uh, power to consent to or, or you know or anything like as that life we do as life yeah. we're all individual selves that are self-making mm. we're autopoetic we're self-making and as we understand that and don't talk like victims you know that's great and then um, nice to follow up on that i see in the chat too, a couple of people have, have been saying, you know, Ani was calling for a, a, a Elizabeth to come back and bring a more uh, female centric and very wise and experienced perspective on exactly that topic. So if you, like Elizabeth, if you have something that you'd like to add further into the conversation, just wanted to give you that invitation to, um, you know, raise your hand to and rejoin. Um, because people, that, that doesn't have to be questions to either, eh? Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, have it's to not be, a question. It's it's a conversation. Questions yeah. to like uh, you know leverage wisdom out of our bromance, totally. you know, totally. which is our thing. But yeah, uh, yeah just jump in and talk yeah. up too. So yeah, well, uh, thanks for putting your, your your hand up. Then if I if I could bear on you, Zeb and Tom and Oliver, I'm seeing your hands are up too, and I don't want you to be ignored. But I'm feeling the this is all about. Our whole network is about we self-organize. And Elizabeth, you're being self-organized up into our into the voice now. So let's hear more from you. But first you have to unmute. Okay. I thought you were in control of that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were in charge there, Jeremy. Uh yeah, of course, we're all created by and creating at the same time. As Anin well, well knows, life is that. It is a network. It is not. There are individuals, but there are no such thing as individuals separate from the web in which they exist. We exist, right? Of course. And sure, there's so much to say. And, and there are other evolution biologists here, women, Tamsin Woolley Barker is with us, for example. And in, in nature, my biggest finding was this cycle of maturation, that there is always a youthful phase of expansion and it can lead to, to serious hostilities and you know elbowing others out of the way and all that, as Tyson, I think, was referring to, that nature has this thing. But eventually it has to grow up into the mature stable phase, like our own bodies, where the cells can keep expanding us up to adolescence and then suddenly we have to become a stable entity for a much longer time. So that cycle of maturation repeats over and over and over again. And indigenous peoples often when they had no big infrastructure technology and stayed within nature learning from it could get through that phase. And from before the agrarian revolution, we already had egalitarian societies and top-down societies, youthful and mature. Right, so now it's our turn to do this for the first time at the global level that we have to do this. We're at the end of about 6,000 years of empire building, juvenile phase empire building. And we're in this transition phase, which is very messy, trying to get to what we the people really want, which is to go back to being the natural caring and sharing humans that is our birthright. And that's where it's headed. That's where I see it. And uh, thank you, Ani, for uh, asking for a little more mm. feminine voice. <laughs> and yet, at the same time, there's these semiconductors that, that are that are needed to continue this system, where economic system, whereby we're we're talking on this Zoom and all that sort of Maybe. thing. Maybe what happened? And Taiwan, Taiwan's making those. And no, but that will continue for a while, for the next decade or two at least. And, you know, Taiwan's making those and America wants that special relationship with Taiwan and China wants that special relationship with Taiwan. Uh, both of them want to have that uh, be the patrons of that place and have them as a client state, you know. So um, that is coming. 
and that's coming no matter how lovely you know we want to you know talk about nature and all this stuff like it's a separate thing over there and hey let's center the voice of nature it's like no no we are nature and the semiconductors and all of the geopolitical nightmares that are going to be spilling out of that quite horrendously just that one thing you know in the next couple of decades and then all the other things as well that's all nature too right except nature. that it's, except it's all that, one thing there's no there's except no that our, our civilization is actually um it's it's just doing i i think it's dangerous to just kind of say well everything is nature therefore there's there's no distinction there are distinctions and there are distinctions that and we humans have built on these kind of separations that have led to separations from the rest of nature. And we're not saying nature, we're all nature, have it within us, but there are separations. And our civilization is the ultimate end point of those layers of separation that is actually destroying nature. That's the whole sense of it's destroying the very self-organized richness and abundance of life. We, so, we are, yeah, that's it. We are, we are yeah. the only species that creates non-recyclable stuff that has right, right, a linear exactly. draining economy. We exactly. are renegades in some very weird ways, and we've become extremely powerful. And yeah. yes, we're going. We need technology, but we should be using what we're doing with with the rest of our oil stuff uh, to build the things that are clean, green, and don't have to use uh, the non-renewables that way. That's um, that's that's yeah. completely right. That's Thank you, Liz. For us, uh, stop we've me got to get through this adolescent crisis. We've got to get through it. Uh, Annie, stop me if you've heard this one. But you know, there's a a big storm over the ocean. Next day, there's billions and billions of starfish on the beach. Standard self help narrative. This one, but with a twist. Um, all the starfish are washed up on the beach. And they're still alive, but they're dying. And there's one man there picking them up one at a time and throwing them out back into the ocean. You know, and then another man comes along and laughs at him and says, ha ha, you know, why are you even bothering doing that? There's no way you can make a difference. There's billions of starfish here. How can that matter? What you're doing matters. And the man picks up a starfish and throws it out into the sea and says, it mattered to that one. Anyway, no one tells the end of that story, which is when an Aboriginal woman walks up to them, slaps them both in the face and says, what are you doing? Throwing these back in. That's a crown of thorn starfish. They've been eating my reef. The ocean's just taken care of it. It's just washed them all out. They're an invasive species yeah. from another place and they're killing the reef. What are you doing? Throwing them back in. Oh my God, those are beautiful. <laughs> what have you done? You bastards. You know, that's that's the actual. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, I love that. There's layers of complexity on complexity. And, um, but uh, I noticed Zeb and, and um, Tom have been really patient here. I Like I, I also saw... Um, just wanted to mention, uh, I, I I did see Elizabeth was talking about Tamsin, and if Tamsin did want to add another voice, I invite you to. But and other than that, we need to kind of begin to close down now because we're heading towards our seventy-five minutes that we had for this uh, for our, our time today. Um, but over to you, Zeb, if you want to do. unmute and share uh, what you have yeah uh kia ora. beautiful to be connected with you all and i've just been loving this yarn and uh thank you annie and elizabeth for broadening that out to the life um span and i just want to narrow into the individual a little bit you talk tyson about uh you know people uh burning in to smell their homes and i'm just wondering about um, personal practice, you know, I, I would like smudge stick and shovel for wisdom or, or conduct business in such a way that, you know, makes the year 2200 a better place or, you know, swim in the lake and try and connect with the Tanifa of Wakatipu. But I just feel like maybe my experience in doing those things that does come from a place of wanting to develop uh, an, an ancestral wisdom or you know, I, I, I don't know if it's as deep of an experience as, as, as what, you know, an indigenous person that is more connected with nature might be. And I just wonder, is there value in this sort of maybe, maybe faking it till you make it? Or, or is there something else to sort of cultivate this indigenous uh, way of being? Um, or is there something else there? 
I, I just say I just say caution and go slow. I'm not jumping in the lake with that tangy focus I, uh, until I know what's going on. I, I think that's probably a female water spirit who, uh, if I jump in there, she's going to grab me, drag me down, and um, and use me as a brick in something she's building <laughs> down there. I wouldn't go near it. I'm going to talk to the aunties first. Fun is that a women's place? Should I go there? Is tangy focus any of my business? I I'm, I'm staying away. <laughs> And I'll wait until someone takes me there and puts me in that water. Um, yeah, but that's that's our way. Um, right I love there. It. Thank you, Tyson. Um, and I'm we're, just as we're as we're kind of coming to closure here. I see Tom and Oliver. If if uh, let me go to you, Tom. If you could just keep your comment or question just to less than a minute, so we can meet our our timing. That would be great. I love that you're upside down, Tom. That would happen. It looks that way on my screen, but I'm a total novice at this. <laughs> However, it is still. Wait, it looks like you're, you're, you're joining us from satellites. So. Life. I just turned 77, and up until now, I felt like a ball bouncing around on some game board, never understanding why I was getting bounced around. Now I do. It was to end up here and deliver the, roughly the message I just did, except it takes so much longer. As a school teacher, I'm a hazard. You push a button, you get an hour's lecture. But the fact is, we have a cancer as a species, which is doing just what any cancer does in our normal cooperative body full of billion, trillions of cells. There are some that have decided they're entitled to more and better, and they start grabbing all the resources. And they unbalance everything and make it hideous. We can do better if we can master early childhood education and build people with simple, well-constructed personalities instead of the conflicting personalities that fight with each other that we now build into them by withholding education until so-called school age when it's too late. Mm -hmm. And that's, I hope, within the minute. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Let me just say one thing and then let's move to Oliver and then come to closure. Um, I hear everything you're saying, but I have a strong sense that the cancer is not our species. The cancer is global capitalism, which has destroying the earth and destroying our uh, basically what our, its whole civilization as part of it, not humans. We have the potential to be very different from that, as you as you pointed out. And so, Oliver, just one uh, again, if you could keep it to a, a minute, I want to make sure you get heard. 100,000 welcomes from Lutruwita, Tasmania. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a Scottish fellow who was born in Lutruwita. Um, I'm studying uh, a diploma of town and rural planning. Um, I had started listening to uh, Tyson's book, uh, podcast um, and didn't read the book while I was working on this uh, assignment that I've just completed. Um, uh, where was I going? Um, <laughs> sorry, I have so many thoughts. I just got confused. Um, you but just, to go back to the one, the one thing, who, if, um, if, if you could just see it before we have to finish, just one yeah, point yeah. to share, Oliver. Um, so to, as I was starting to try and heal my intergenerational childhood trauma, I, uh, the first place that I started was with my own language and to anyone in this chat uh, who is wanting to explore land-based spiritual relationships, uh, start with your own language. Like the, the, that's already there. Like it's, it's held in the land and um, the stories are there and they're in our language and you just have to go in and, and, and tap into that in our own language and, and those Beautiful. relationships there before oh, you guy, man, get your ever trying on. to. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. thank thanks, Oliver. And uh, uh, Tyson, we we're almost at the end. So why don't we just hear from you as the, the last voice? Uh, real fast. The, or a... no, same one. I, I guess direct people, uh, you know, to the yarn that we had there. A, a lot of the things have been raised, you know, especially that idea of people as a cancer. It's um, you know, we did talk a lot through the maximum power principle and stuff like that, and how that works, and the, the symbiosis and uh, interdependence and all this kind of thing. You know, you can't blame a cancer patient from Fukushima and their selfish cells going like, oh man, that selfish lung cell that decided he wanted to expand out to the knee. You know, that's um, you know, it's that selfish cell. He need no. There's a little bit of radiation there. There's some there's some environmental stuff going on. 
you know, go easy on yourself, human being. There's nothing wrong with humans. We're not bloody, mm-hmm. yeah. We're not naturally cancerous um, at right. all. We're really, really good entities that yeah. have an ecology. We have a very special ecological niche here, mm-hmm. and we're all born into that. You know, mm. it's um. Unfortunately, there's just some other stuff going on. Like there's some radiation that's um, you know, making a bit of a mess. But we'll be right. We'll get back to it. I love it. Thank you. I love closing on that. I, and I just feel so attuned with that, Tyson. And thanks to you, Tyson. Thanks to everybody. I, I've got to tell you, I'm so thrilled to feel the energy and the self-organized flow of ideas and perspectives that I've just been seeing and sensing from this group, which is exactly the idea of these interactive conversations. It's not just you know these people talking and people listening. It's us as a group pushing these ideas, worrying them through, like stirring them up. So thank you. And just to let everybody know, um, on Tuesday, uh, coming up on May 3rd, is going to be another of our monthly live network meetings where anybody from the Deep Transformation Network, um, and if you don't know it, maybe we can put that link in there, yeah, so you can sign up and be part of it. Um, where we get as a group to hang out together for an hour, or actually we're we're going to do it for an hour and 15 minutes. And I'll be talking to two uh, amazing change makers that day and talking about how we can scale up the movement for deep transformation that is so badly needed. It's not going to be me talking. We're going to have group conversations and get back to a bigger group. It's um, so um, that's happening on Tuesday. And I'm really excited to let you know about uh, the, the next one of these Um, live interactive conversations, just like we've had today. It's actually going to be taking place. It's almost like a follow-on, perfect follow-on from this conversation today. It's on May 31st. That's a Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific. And I am excited to announce it's going to be with Wahinkpe Topa, also known as Four Arrows, and Dasha Narvaez, who together have recently published a book that's called Restoring the Kinship Worldview. Indigenous Voices introduced 28 precepts for rebalancing life on planet Earth. It's like a perfect sequel to this conversation today. And in fact, Tyson, is um, his blurb is there, proudly presented as the first one on their website, where he talks about um, uh, the, the foundation is good relations making kin both human and non-human. We have a story from a gathering of some of the finest Indigenous thinkers on the planet. And um, so I love that book. I th- it was great because it actually does go into these deeper insights and actual practices about all kinds of things from gender roles, restorative justice, sacred competition, mutual dependence, things that actually go way beyond the cliches so we can hear a lot more about these perspectives. So um, check back on the network in a few days, the event will be up there. And I'll let everyone know who signed up for this. I'll send you an email with a link to that once um, the link is all ready. Thank you all for taking part in it. What feels like a rich, alive, energy-driven conversation for the benefit of life and for all of us that share this, this earth. So thank you. Bye.